everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Textile Talks. I'm Amy Milne, Executive Director of the Quilt Alliance. Thank you for taking time to join us today. Uh, a special welcome to all those who are here for the first time. It looks like we've got a great crowd assembling here. We'll give everyone just a few minutes to uh, to keep connecting. Um, we're so glad you found us and uh, say hi in the chat box uh, and tell us where you're connecting from. I'm uh, in Morganton, North Carolina, in Western North Carolina. Um, and we'd love to hear where you're uh, from. We try to keep track of it. And we're gonna be watching a video today. So right out of the, right at the top here, I wanna um, recommend that if you have headphones, you might wanna put those on. It's uh, easier to hear some of the recorded video that way. You don't have to obviously, but sometimes it helps with volume. Um, and I want to remind you that Texel Talks is a weekly series. So if this is the first one that you're connecting to, you can tune in weekly on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and this is a partnership project. We started back in April of 2020 um, uh, in response to the pandemic and trying to reach a all those at home and a wider audience. Uh, so the Quilt Alliance is one of four partner organizations that you see here. Um, SACWA, uh, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, the International Quilt Museum, and Surface Design Association are our partners. And my colleague Lucy from SACWA will help me staff the chat box today. And uh, she's going to enter in the link to all the recordings because all of these programs are recorded and you can access them and rewatch them via YouTube, which is a great feature. The Quilt Alliance is definitely the smallest member of our group, but our mission is huge to document, preserve, and share the stories of all quilts and all quilt makers. And our vision is no more anonymous quilt makers. And today we're going to present a demonstration of our longest running oral history project and the largest one of its kind in the world, Quilters Save Our Stories or QSOS. And you can visit our website to listen to other QSOS interviews and become a member or donor. We rely on this kind of community support to carry out our important mission. Um, and that's www.quiltalliance.org. Just a quick reminder, we've got um, a lot of folks on the program today. Please use the chat box for your greetings as you have been. And if you have any comments or if you need some technical help um, and then use the Q&A box to enter your questions. Um, you can also turn on live captions. I want to remind you about that um, by clicking on the live transcript or CC button on your Zoom controls. And um, if you want to grab your headphones now, uh, or just keep in mind that you might need to uh, adjust your device volume. So again, today we're going to watch a Quilters Save Our Stories QSOS interview with Bonnie Hunter. And this unique oral history project includes over 1,200 interviews with quilt makers who were interviewed by volunteers. And most of those volunteers were um, quilt makers themselves over the past 23 years. It is not only the largest collection of interviews with quilters, but also the largest grassroots oral history projects of its kind in the world. The Quilt Alliance is currently in the final phase of transitioning this collection to a website that will allow users to fully access and search the collection recordings, um, transcripts, photographs, and indexes. And 2023 is the Alliance's 30th anniversary as a nonprofit, and we plan to re release new guidelines um, <clears throat> for the QSOS project that will make it easier than ever to participate, both as a volunteer interviewer or a scribe, someone who take, takes notes during the interview, or an interviewee. Um, your story, your story, 
just like other uh, quilters that are maybe uh, like Bonnie or other quilters that you follow, this is a project not just for quilt stars. This is a project for anyone who makes quilts. And your story deserves to be documented, preserved, and shared. So as you listen to Bonnie's story at her interview today, envision yourself in her place or as an interviewer like Francis. Uh, so Bonnie's interview was recorded with Francis on Wednesday of last week, and we recorded it via Zoom. We weren't sure that Bonnie would be able to connect fully, given her remote location in mouth of Wilson, Virginia, but it worked great. And we're so grateful to share that story, that video with you next. Um, on this slide, I'm showing you some of the many ways that you can connect with Bonnie online. And Lucy's just put it in the chat as well. Um, her website, her blog, her Facebook group, which is a public group, and her Instagram. Um, and if you already belong to that group, group, you know what a great community is. It is, and Bonnie really is makes herself available and is really responsive. So check that out. And she, Bonnie, could not be with us today because tomorrow, if you follow her and you are one of her friends, you know that tomorrow is her big, uh, or Friday, sorry, is her mystery quilt launch uh, when the first clue gets released. Uh, but Francis is going to, Francis O'Rourke Dowell is the interviewer for this uh, great interviewer, and she's going to interview, and she's going to join us after the video to talk a little bit about what it's like to be an interviewer, because I also like you to think about uh, who you might like to interview and, and see it from her perspective, um, and, you know, we'll be able to collect any questions you have for Bonnie and make sure she gets those too, or you can reach out to her via her her website or blog, or blog. So let's get started. Let's watch the video and stick around afterwards because we're going to have a great little conversation with Francis. And then I want to share with you how you can share your quilt story on an upcoming textile talk. So stay tuned. Hello, I am Frances O'Rourke Dow. This is a QSOS Quilter Save Our Stories oral history interview with Bonnie Hunter. I am speaking from my home in Durham, North Carolina. Bonnie is in the mouth of Wilson, North Carolina. The date is November 16th, 2022, and it's about 2.09 in the afternoon. Bonnie, hello, how are hello, you? Hello, hello, right off the top. I'm gonna to correct you, I'm in Virginia. Mouth of oh. Wilson, Virginia. Do you want to yeah, start? Yeah, you know, over? when I, I said Mouth of Wilson, North Carolina, it felt unnatural. Yeah. But are you just to... over, you're over the state line? Is that right? Just barely. Like, like cross the state line and make an immediate left. <laughs> All right. So, so I'm sorry, but North Carolina will claim you. Um, I feel like you're ours and therefore. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I'll claim North the Carolina. The record will show Mouth of Wilson, Virginia. Virginia. Yes, because it's the rec, the official record, but we feel like you could really be in North Carolina for all intents and purposes. Absolutely. Yes, we want you. Okay, <laughs> well, um, let us uh, get started because I can't wait to talk about this quilt or hear about this quilt behind you. So tell me about the quilt you brought in today. I'm so super excited because this is one that had been in in the design wall of my mind for a long time um ever since phones came with cameras i've used my phone to um, capture vintage quilts antique quilts blocks parts pieces in antique malls and shops and uh i found this quilt i fell in love with it the original had much bigger pieces much bigger blocks and i think there were only three fabrics in the quilt but I fell in in love with it. It looks like there's ovals, not circles, not squares, not rectangles, but these ovals. And I was just captivated. So it, it stayed with me and stayed with me and stayed with me. And then when I had some leftover pieces from a previous quilt that I finished, I thought, oh, these pieces might just work to, to do this design. So this comes completely from, I would call it my trash stash. 
<laughs> the stuff that you that's too precious to throw away, but you want to, you know, put it to into good use into something. So I don't know if you can tell from where you are. I did send some um, close up pictures, but there are some string pieced units and there's some stitch and flip corners and there's some little rows of squares and there's a little square to square unit. And um, it, it, it came together over many, many months, those times where I felt like my brain is on overload. I just want to sew on something without a deadline. And, and this is what happened. You know, so it just, it, it came together and I call it unchained. Maybe it should have been called unhinged, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I absolutely love it. And um, it'll be a pattern coming out next year. And I want to show it side by side with the vintage one that it came from. Mm -hmm. Cause I think that's helpful for people to see that you don't have to make something exactly like you found your inspiration. Mm -hmm. Now, now when someone looks at this quilt, what do you think they will conclude about you? <laughs> <laughs> um, they'll probably think that my pieces are too small. Um, they'll probably think that that my stash um, it goes over several decades, which it which it does. I like to think of myself as an equal opportunity fabric user. <laughs> I love reclaimed fabrics, um, whether they come from people who don't want their scraps anymore or things that I, I find that I can incorporate that are maybe not off the bolt. And uh, it's just, there are several spots on the timeline of my life in this, in this quilt. Yeah, you can look at that and say, yeah, that was 1987. That was a good year. You know, here's, here's 2001 when my son graduated high school. That was a good year. And now we're in 2023 the year 2000 seems like yesterday and it's 23 years ago in that fabric in there. Yeah. So it is, it is a timeline. Well, where I, I'm curious, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the, all the different places, uh, you know, the, these stashes and the idea of, of reusing or upcycling, or where do you get your fabric, Bonnie Hunter? Where is it? Is it all just one big stash <laughs> at the barn or I, I get my fabric anywhere that I can find it. You know, I, I love working with fabrics from recycled clothing, shirts, dresses, skirts, 100% cotton woven, um, particularly. But I, you know, with a retreat house next door, I, I have been known to go through the trash and see what people leave at the end of retreat. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have boxes that will show up on my doorstep I know you like scraps. My mother-in-law passed away. I've taken all that I can use, but thought you could use these and that kind of stuff. I just, I just find it so precious, all of those little pieces. So the, the more you throw in, the more fun it is, the less rhyme or reason there is, the mm -hmm. less matchy matchy things have to be if you can just throw it all in. I just thought of that, like the, the neighbor lady where you, you leave your extra zucchini on the doorstep <laughs> you are that, that the, lady. The back seat of the car. Yeah, exactly. And given all, I mean, I, and I, I love that so much that people are leaving. I, I love actually my favorite images of you going through the trash and the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> I have great. no shame. <laughs> there, there's no shame. How much is your fabric selection when you're actually Picking fabric for a quilt is intuitive. How much of it is intentional? You know, the one thing that I buy a lot of are neutrals and things that I'll use for backgrounds because those are the canvas that everything else plays on. Mm -hmm. So like the quilt that's behind me, I relied heavily on my neutral fabrics. Immunity to the whole. So those mm -hmm. are the things when I go to the quilt shop, I head right towards the neutrals and, and pull in, you know, those things with fun little figures on them, things with words, things with numbers, anything with a saying that might mean something to me. Um, if I'm out of state and traveling, I love to find something that is representative of where I've traveled to mm -hmm. and, and throw those in too. It's kind of like Bonnie was here, you know, throw that, throw that in there. And, um, 
right now i was i was showing a a group of quilters that just just left yesterday they came next door my my office is in an old reclaimed post office building the retreat house is next door so they came over for a visit and were asking me about my stash and i opened up my cabinets where the yardage is and it's it's set rainbow you know so you go from red to pink to you know yellow to orange to whatever and i had to confess that the majority of my fabric stashing happened in the early 2000s when i was raising teenage boys <laughs> so oh so you're self-medicating yeah i was self-medicating <laughs> But, but now I'm faced with cabinets full of, of yardage, and most of them are like one yard, two yard pieces, um, that they're now reaching 20 years old. And I love them just as much. And I'm really glad with the price of fabric that I stashed back then in, instead of now. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, my goal is to ju just keep sewing them. When, you're, when, when you need something, you buy something, you throw it in. and um you know so combining the the newer more modern fabrics with some of the ones i've had for a while and that makes things kind of interesting mm -hmm. when did you start quilting oh my gosh um really got into patchwork as a newly married gal um i found a, a a quilting magazine in the grocery store when we were first married and I was married in 1981 at 19 years old my husband was 21 so we've been together 41 years and, and so the fabric buying has not thrown him off at all <laughs> so um there was a home decor magazine that had you can make this and you can make this and you can make this and there was a patchwork pillow but I thought oh well, that's really cute so I could do that. And that was before rotary cutters really were on the scene. But I just I just fell in love with patchwork. It's the one thing that has stayed with me through the whole thing. I mean, day every day I have to do something with patchwork. Have you ever veered off into art quilts or you, you've made um, some remarks about negative space, uh, modern <laughs> Yeah, I don't do much with negative space. Um, <laughs> there was a stint there for maybe six years or so where I started designing patterns for dolls and stuffed animals. So like teddy bears and pigs and cows and chickens and, and reindeer and, and whatever. And I had those in the Butterick catalog. So those were fun. It was fun to do the dolls and to dress them in their little romper suits or their little outfits with bloomers and bonnets and and aprons and whatever mm -hmm. but um all that did was leave more scraps for the scrap quilts that still kept coming together mm -hmm. so, when did, what, what period were you doing making oh, the dolls and dolls see, my oh. son my son was born in 1990 so that would be about about 92 okay. to about 96 seven right in right in there that was the first time that i ever vended at quilt market and um that's where i was approached by butterick and they said hey you know we like these we'd like to put them in our our big heavy um ca pattern catalogs and put them all over the world and you can just sit back and get a royalty <laughs> and i said okay so it was really fun it was really really a fun um thing to do but at this point, so you're that's sort of your professional entry into the world of stitching. You were you yeah. were you were quilting, but not professional. Right. I did. Yeah, I would just I just made quilts on my own. I did not want quilting to become a business because I was afraid I would burn myself out and then not love it anymore. Well, so, yeah. So I did the doll thing, and then you know, true to form, the doll thing did not love it anymore. <laughs> But the quilting remained. Yeah. And uh, do you see? I mean, this, in some ways, this sounds like a silly question. Okay. But is quilting a business for you, or has the business just is what what happened? Because obviously, you're a teacher. You well, are, it, it was very businessy for a long time, and there were book deadlines and magazine deadlines and shows and lectures and workshops and and travel and whatever and then that that just got overwhelming hmm. so about well about six years ago i really started making an exit plan 
on, on what I was going to do to kind of scale things back. Cause there's really two ways that you can go. You can start hiring staff when you can no longer handle the volume yourself and you can have stunt sewers and you can have people that market your fabric and you can have people that sew your samples and you have people that do your website and people that do your social media and and it takes a village really it does and i i didn't want to go that way i'm going to be 61 in two months ah 61 i i should be thinking of retirement i did not want to go bigger mm -hmm. and so that's when the whole idea of the retreat house came in into play. And then I started backing off of having other people publish my books where I was beholden to their deadlines and, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And so I just told myself, you're going to make what you want to make when you want to make it. And that made me that, that set loose the creativity. And then mm. I wasn't traveling and teaching so much anymore. So I wasn't teaching the same thing after the same thing, after the same thing, after the same thing. So I could um, turn my attention towards um, new designs and new things that, that intrigued me and, and colors that I wanted to try or a block I wanted to try. And I made a promise to myself to only make what I wanted to make. And that brought the happiness back. Mm. That brought the happiness back. And so now it's the, it's the best of both worlds. I'll put out a digital design when I want. We'll run my yearly mystery quilt yearly, and that's fun. Um, we'll do some challenges throughout the year, um, and that's fun for blog readers and social media people that follow. We do little challenges. And mostly it's just focusing on just being a quilter and making what I want to make in my own terms, in my own time. That's wonderful. Um, it, it, that's such an interesting arc, you know, that you got out before you burned out on quilting. Yeah. Tell us about your retreat house. Um, how, oh my God. where is it? What is it? When did you build it? What's happening? Next door. <laughs> we had purchased, um, I need a little sip of water. Hold on. Me too. We had posted, uh, we had, we had put our place in North Carolina on the market. And we came to Virginia because my husband wanted some acreage. Farm boy, he's from Eastern Oregon. He, he, he has to have land. You're not anything unless you have land. So we found this place and we walked through with our realtor and the wheels were turning. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, I really like it. And I said, well, I like it too. And he said, let's take a drive and see what else is around here. So we came up the highway and we were coming around this curve to come to the stop sign. And I saw this huge wraparound porch on this old Victorian farmhouse with a complete with turret and a sign that said for sale by owner three parcels. And I was so super excited because I had thought this is, would be the perfect thing. This, this would be the, the thing to do. And he said, don't even think about it at that time. So it took about a year and a half after we purchased the our, our our cabin on our acreage where we live about a year and a half later that house was still for sale and I said you know we're getting older I don't want to be on the road three weeks out of the month this is what I'd like to do and he helped make that happen mm -hmm. so we've had um the inn open we opened in 2020 we had three retreats and then closed due to COVID mm -hmm. but we reopened in June under under cautions and restrictions and following all the rules and we've just finished we're just finishing our third season of retreaters so yeah it's wonderful that's great i can't wait to come i'm going to you need um, to come you're not that far i know but, i know yeah. well now that i know that it's in virginia though mm. yeah. oh, what it's a state line <laughs> I, I love state virginia line, a couple miles to north yeah. carolina uh, yeah. um okay um that's wonderful and i know and it seems like it's booked up all the time yeah yeah we have we have a waiting list and occasionally a group will say you know we came last year so we're going to give up our week for next year and then i'll just go to the waiting list and contact that group and say hey we've got an opening for you in april or we've got an opening for you in in october would your group like to come that week and we just go down the waiting list until we find a group that's going to take those dates Oh, that's great. That's yeah. wonderful. 
Well, let me um, redirect a little bit. I want to get back to okay. you personally. Um, have you ever used quilts to get through a difficult time? Boy, I think we all have. I absolutely think we all have. Um, the most recent thing I can think of was when um, Russia first invaded Ukraine and we all pulled out our blue and yellow and we started sewing blocks and quilts in support just as a place to put our feelings, you know, where do we, how do we deal with this? And there were so, um, sew alongs organized. We did a sew along um, for a, a quilt um, called Hearts of Hope. And there were several that were sent overseas. So that, that was a, when you feel like you can't make a difference, just sewing really, really helps, especially when you're sewing with intent. And then I, I think that, you know, we've all had somebody that was ill. Um, my brother uh, passed away three years ago from a, a brain cancer and he, he had a good almost five years and even went into um, remission for a while but when he was first going through his chemo and radiation and, and uh, surgery the, the first thing that I thought was I have to make him a quilt I just I just have to make him a quilt and I need it to be masculine and I need it to be somewhat simple and I need to do it as fast as I can and get it to him as fast as I can. And, and, and that's like sending your, your love and your hugs to somebody who's um, either they're having a, a surgery or an illness, or maybe they've lost a job or they're moving away or, or things like, things like that. So yeah, if only the quilts could talk, right? The, the quilts know everything. So yeah. Well, and I'm so sorry about your brother. Just oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, but it, when you started, you know, it, it, when you mentioned about when Ukraine, when, when what so many quilters were doing something, were coming together in different groups via different organizations and making quilts. And this brings us to something that I feel is really central to who you are and, and and that it brings us to community and so i would love for you to talk about the importance of community and quilt making in particular online community oh absolutely um where do i where do i start so we had we had moved for my husband's job and we moved to a little town called burley idaho and he became plant controller of the food processing plant um, was an Orida plant there. And I went to visit his new office for the first time. And he says, look, honey, I'm all hooked up to the internet and everything here. And I think we need to have the internet at home. And I said, why do we need the internet at home? This is like 1995. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, look, there's, there's quilting stuff here. And he pulls up a website. There's communities here. And it was this list serve we had to pay for. I think it was $20 a year so that you could get um, all of these emails from these global quilters from, from all over the world. And I remember the very first New Year's Eve that here's coming these emails, Happy New Year from Australia, Happy New Year from Japan, Happy New Year from South Africa. And you just watched this whole thing come ac uh, across the globe as, as one by one each time zone was saying, Happy New Year. And I have never felt so connected to quilters as I did at that moment. Um, and from there, it just went on. We had chat rooms. We had swaps by the, by the year 2000. I, did you participate in any of those 2000 swaps where you were swapping squares, trying to do a charm quilt with 2000 different fabrics? No, I wasn't quilting yet then. You weren't quilting <laughs> yet? Oh my gosh. Oh, I did. I missed it. I did. And there was this thing where you would have this list of names and you would you would send so many and you'd, you'd get some, some, so many back. And the little, little baggies of 20 squares going to this address of this person that you didn't know who they were. And then they're sending you some back and all the different ones. I mean, the, the community was just fantastic. I, I think about how things were, you know, a hundred years ago, you'd have ladies gathered around a frame at maybe somebody's house or on the porch or in the church or whatever, and they'd all sit around. And while they're quilting, 
they would talk about, you know, what was going on in their lives, whatever was going on um, in the world around them at that time. And then here comes the internet and it's like that only bigger, you know? I, I can't imagine what we would have done with COVID if we didn't have the internet and our quilt community online to stay in contact with while the world just raged outside, you know, and so much unknown. But we had each other, you know, even, even from across the globe. It's, it's hard to really put it into words. I hope things never go back to the way they were 100 years ago. I kind of like this. I kind of like this. Well, you have created on your uh, your own community, which is a, you have a, a Facebook page. How many people are m members of your page at this point? Oh, good. It's in, it's in like 150,000 some. And, um, you know, they, they don't all read every day all the time. I, I know that. Um, the one I'm more excited about would be my open studio group on Facebook. There's... Mm -hmm like 93,000 and we're all gearing up to do this mystery quilt that starts Black Friday yes, and, and they're, they're, they're posting all of their their colorways of fabrics that they've chosen and, and again they're it's global and it just it just mm -hmm. feels like being part of something it's just wonderful. Well, I want to, this, of course, this is a, the historic record. So I want to talk about your mis mystery quilt. It's a quilt along, yes? You get yes. clues every yes. week. Yes. Um, why did you start it? How does it build community? Who is it for? Give, give us the, the background. We've been what doing is it for about, about 13 years, maybe 14. I'm not sure. But it all started because I was moving from South Carolina to North Carolina. We did live in North Carolina before uh, moving here. And my husband had already relocated because of the job. And I stayed down there because I had a son still in school and we had to sell the house and it had to show well and we had to move the stash and, you know, all that stuff. And I just decided, hey, who wants, who wants to do a mystery quilt so long? It'll have easy units. We'll do it together. Let's just do this for fun. I don't have a husband coming home at night. It's kind of lonely. Let, let's do this. And that was the very first one. And boy, was that fun. And then we, we did it a, a couple different times of the year, but I settled in on running it. We give out the yardage requirements and the colors on Halloween because mm -hmm. you've got just about a month until Black Friday. And just like how I was alone, um, while my husband was, you know, new job, new location, I'm home alone. Um, I know there's a lot of quilters that are also alone during the holidays. Mm -hmm. You know, you have new widows, you have um, someone who's taking care of their elderly parents and they can't travel for Christmas. You've got, you know, kids with grandkids that are on the other side of the country or out of the country, they can't come. And the holidays are really hard for more people than we realize. So I wanted to um, get them involved so that they could have community during the holidays and um, have some fun with it. So that's what we've been doing for the last um, 13 years is having this run, you know, Halloween comes the yardage and the colors and the background information. Black Friday is clue number one. And then it usually runs seven to nine weeks, depending on how many um, different units we have and it's every Friday they come to my blog and and download their next clue the next part what mm -hmm. unit are we making this week how many do we need what colors are they there what size are they how's this all going to fit together we don't know until the final reveal and that happens in January and so. that's a big that's a big day anyone who's on quilting social media is like oh, all of it's big it's, it's, it's all big and it's, it's and it's so much pressure because what if they don't like it that's that's me what if they don't like it but that's what you're in an interesting position because you you're very much a, a, a community leader and it's just you it's not an organization right you, there's no one go well I, I i'm sorry you don't like this why don't you talk to my boss right you're the boss right. so what right. is your role in this community and what kind what kind of what what's the joy in that but what what's the pressures that come along with that my favorite little posts that come out that we get a we get a lot of influx this time of the year because people want 
to participate and they, they want some help or whatever. New quilters going, I want to do this, I want to do this, but how hard is it and can I do this? And we break it down into individual units. So you might have half square triangles of a certain size. You might have nine patches of a certain size or maybe rail fence units. And no, these are not what's in this year's mystery quilt, just in case anybody wants to know. <laughs> but, but yeah, don't do those. But um, if you break it down, you can do it. If you break it down, you can do it. So we, I love the encouragement that the, that the quilters give each other. We have male quilters as well as female quilters. We have quilting couples who do it, work on it together. We have groups that will print out their clues on Friday and meet at the local quilt shop on Saturday and have a sew day to do it all together. And we, we have quilters that sew remotely by Zoom, just the same way we're talking so that you know, she's working over here on hers, but her sister who's across the country is working on hers and they just do it through Zoom. So mm -hmm. so that's really fun that way. And I, I think of it as, as a skill builder. If somebody doesn't want um, the full size quilt. So our quilt this year, it's it's under 80 inches square. So I consider that like a full size. You could, you could mm -hmm. make less if you want. If you're not sure you want the full quilt, make half the unit. You may have some units left over. You may have to make a few more to round things out, but mm -hmm. you'll have a good idea of what you want to do when the reveal happens. Right. Yeah. What's your role? You are the designer. What yeah. other what, what other role do you play? Not just in cheerleader. the I'm a cheerleader. In the community. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. and what are the pressures of that? What what's uh, the upside is you are beloved. I think it's safe to say in the quilting world, More what's the inside of being, of, of being this, you know, people know your name, people know your face, they feel like they know you. And, and you, are, uh, I, I, you know, I'm in your quilt, in the you know, Facebook group, you are also, you, you are very, uh, you're very much a leader and there are times that you, that you don't put up with very much. Well, I've sometimes, I've got a very long fuse but when the fuse goes, watch out. And that, that usually is, you know, if people get rude and, or they, they forget to put their own filter on, you know, that, that I, I will call somebody on the carpet if they're being unkind mm -hmm. to others. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fine balance because you don't, you don't want to do that. Um, you know, we, we, we are global. So I, I keep trying to emphasize that, that, um, that we've we've got all all kinds of backgrounds in here from from all over the world. I think we've got every country represented. So you're going to have um, differences of opinion on everything. So we really you know no politics. We prefer you know no no religious things. You know don't don't march in here and start 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 giving Bible quotes because we might have somebody who be, belongs to, you know, some other things. So those are the kinds of things that will be, be great on your own page. But right. re just remember when you come here, you're coming into my living room and you're all here together and we yeah. all have different life experiences and we try to respect that. Yeah. So yeah. we don't put up with any hate speech, any finger pointing, um, you know, things like that. Yeah. Leave that outside the door. We're here to quilt and to find the similarities. Yes. in our relationships you know and and uh and that's not always easy to do it's we've got a lot of tumultuous times you know it's in the world few years yeah yeah for the last few years so we try to this is the space that should be safe where we can share our our creativity the things that we've made the things that um we're thinking of and we just ask that people be kind in their comments mm -hmm. you know not like you i can't believe you use that fabric for your border you know no <laughs> or, or, or you turned that one wrong you know? <laughs> so be, just be kind and then hopefully that'll carry as we go outside of the group and into our own lives and our own communities in person we can dream yeah we can yeah, we can. yeah. what do you think is the biggest challenge confronting quilt makers today i would say the cost of goods the cost of fabric. If I were a brand new quilter who didn't have any 
quilters in my um, family line, any you no know, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, sisters, whatever that could encourage me. Your biggest expense is is going to be your fabric. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I I think that as quilters, those of us who have accumulated you know thirty years of stuff, that we need to look at what we have as a scholarship for those that are just coming in and be willing to share what we have. The the it's so much fun to buy the fabric for the quilt top itself. But when you think about new quilters and buying just the backing fabric, you're buying six to eight yards of something for the back of a quilt. Just that itself is can be daunting for a new quilter. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would say it's the cost of goods. So I, I love designs that will use up every inch of that fabric. I don't want a lot of fabric waste. I don't want a lot of cut off corners that go in the trash. I don't, you know, I want to use as much as I can to get as much value out of it as I can. Okay. Um, what do you think makes a great quilt? No negative space. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I think a, a quilt, there are so many different great quilts out there, but for me, I like my eyes going from area to area to area to area across the quilt and finding something a little bit different there, mm -hmm. you know, D different shades, different colors, different shapes, um, something that'll hold my interest. Mm -hmm. So like the quilt behind me, I would say that there are no two ovals alike and you couldn't see it hanging in a quilt show and walk by it and go, oh yeah, I have that fabric line. It's, it's not a fabric line kind of, kind of a project. And those are the ones that make me wonder, where did she get her scraps? How long did she collect her scraps or he, if he's the maker? And, um, you know, how long did it take to, to, to build that variety? And what were they thinking when they, when they put this together? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that make a quilt interesting for me. Um, I've never made a quilt from a kit. I think kits are valuable for people that are just starting out. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a great place to start. You know, I, I've done cross stitch kits and that was a great way because you had all the thread there and you didn't have to buy extra skeins and it was, you know, you had sufficient for your need and that kept the price down. Um, but I, I think if we're talking about our history in quilting and the things that will be left with our stories after we've crossed the Quilty Rainbow Bridge, if we all made quilts that looked the same, there wouldn't be that much of a story to tell. Mm -hmm. If all if all the quilts were alike in all the same fabrics and all the same, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I like quilts that teach me a little bit about the maker and who they were. I like that. Yeah. Um, in some ways, given everything we've talked about, this question feels a little redundant, but I want you to answer it anyway. Why is quilt making important to your life? I don't. I don't know who I would be without quilting. If I try to imagine my life without fabric and thread daily, what what would I have done with my life? I, I don't, I have no idea. I have no answer. I don't know what other things I would have pursued. I don't know where I would have ended up. I don't know. It's It's like breathing. I mean, if you take take that out of the equation, um, I don't know. It, it has brought wonderful people through my life. The best relationships, um, the strongest relationships I have formed with other women, have been through quilting. It's it's like the the thread that binds. The you know the stitched together with love. All of those lovely. Um, colloquialisms and little little statements and things like that I you know I I quilt because I am you know <laughs> yeah I don't know I don't know it would be really interesting to see I don't I don't have quilters in my past life 
you know, before I came, was born that I know of. Now, my mom had um, her aunt, my mom's aunt was a quilter, but she, I never really knew her. But I would love to know if, if things like a propensity for quilting and patchwork and love of fabric and all things sewing related really did come through the gene. Because if that's so, I got him in spades. So thank you to whoever <laughs> passed that on. But um, I don't know. Can you imagine your life without quilting in it? Not anymore. Not, Not anymore. anymore. So I started a little later than you, you did. I was in my early 40s. Um, so, but yeah, and now it's, it's, it's integral to it. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because I, we're close in age. I, I'll be 59 next, this coming year. So you're at a, in some ways uh, you have, uh, you're at, a, I know that this has been a transition that has taken yeah. a little while, but you are in a different space, literally. Uh, where you are in Virginia and with the retreat center and all of that. But, you know, with any luck, you have many, many quilting years ahead of you. What is your hope? What, what, what are you looking forward to? What would, uh, what, what do you have goals set for? Here's what I have to do. Here's well, what you know, we were talking about uh, community, mm -hmm. online community. Uh, with the, with the internet quilters and the and the whole thing out there, what having the retreat has done has has given me in person community as well, and and I've loved that. I've loved knowing I get up in the morning all giddy because there's twelve ladies next door and they just might feed me breakfast, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I get to share their life experiences mm. as we you know view their projects and what they're working on and the story behind and. And so I, I don't go in as in depth as much as you do in these interviews and things like that. But I feel like um, meeting different people and talking to them and seeing what they're working on. And we have this connection and we love the fabric and we love the thread and we love the stitching, whether it's by hand or machine. And it's just like, this is our tribe. This is, this is who we are. This is what we do. And um, as far as the future goes, I think I'll just do this as long as I can. Mm. you know and then you know hopefully pass the torch back on to somebody else you know maybe when I'm 75 that seems to be the goal I'll, I'll I'll run the retreat center till I'm 75 and then maybe find another quilter who'd like to take it over since it's already up and running and turnkey and then then we'll just pass the torch mm. yeah well I hope so it, um yeah, it's a one. It's a wonderful idea. I love that thought. Well, Bonnie, is there anything that I have not asked you that you wished I had? I don't think so. I feel like I have just talked your ears off. It's like, does, oh. this, does this woman ever stop yammering? No. Uh, <laughs> that would be the point of doing this, Bonnie. Yeah. Is to talk and talk and talk. But yeah. it's been wonderful, and um. I, I I really am in love with the quilt behind you, by oh, the way. Thank you. We so appreciate thank your time. You. And I do think, you know, with the, the QSOS project, I, most it's we want all sorts of voices for, I, I, you know, I keep using the phrase for the historic record, but I do think that quilt history is important because it is a, the history of, of artists and of women's lives, primarily some men's lives as well. But so yeah. I think it's really important to have your voice as part of this ongoing history is this this long, this long document. So thank well, you so much for thank spending you so much time for with the us. invite. Yeah, I love uh, chatting with you. Yeah, I do too. I'm coming up to the retreat center. I am. Oh, good. Just, I'll, bring just come. I'll show you around. What a great interview. Um, I'm going to ask Francis to join me now. Hi, Francis. Hey. Hello, everybody. Hey. Love and everyone's comments in the chat. It's um, yeah. It was really fun. What an active group. I mean, you can tell this is a group who's used to community and they love the way that Bonnie, I think I love the way that Bonnie creates community. And we, you know, we couldn't have her on today because of the timing of the mystery quilt, but that's why we wanted to have this, you know, time this presentation for right before she releases it because she has created community 
um, in such a special way during the holidays, especially, you know, when people, a lot of people are really needing it and missing it. And um, her interview, I want to say that her interview will be uh, presented with the rest of the historic QSOS collection on the QSOS website, which is QSOS. Uh, dot quiltalliance.org and archived at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress and also at the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky. So I wanted to say, Francis has done, you have done a bunch of QSOS interviews. I don't know the number, but this yeah. is just one of many that you've done. And You've also written a lot of articles, done interviews with people and quilters for uh, articles that you've written. You write for Quilt Folk magazine and you've written for curated quilts as well. Yes. And I'm just curious if you can tell us what the difference between an oral history interview like this is and an interview that's, you know, a, a interview not for oral history, for a magazine or for a book. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a world of difference. It's not, it's so freeing to just be able to talk to someone, like uh, talking with Bonnie or anyone, where you can let you. I always start with a list of questions that come from the project. There's sort of questions to pick and right. choose from, but the conversation can go in any direction. First of all, um, so I love that, and I, I love that I then don't have to edit all the wonderful conversation that we've had into yeah. 700 words, if I'm lucky, 700 words, which all is not many words, you know? So you're really, it's like the, the articles tend to be kind of overviews. Here's this person's life story and a very little amount of space. And it's wonderful in a way, because that's, you know, with these articles, you introduce people to quilters and particularly with quilt folk, it's you know, oftentimes quilters you've never heard of, but who have wonderful stories. But with the QSOS interviews, you get to go deep and you get to do these deep dives, whether it's Bonnie Hunter or, you know, someone in my neighborhood who makes quilts. And I've, you know, and of course, Bonnie, we all know is, so it's a very special person, but we're all very special people. You know, we've gathered here today because as a community, we we love Bonnie and how and, and the role she plays in our community. But the fact is, anyone you talk to, man, especially if you say uh, the question that, that I like to ask very much is how has quilting gotten you through a difficult time? And you get into some real amazing stories um and but also it's like you know if you say how's quilting brought you joy you also but but it's really people telling stories which is my favorite thing that's all I want is people to tell me stories right and especially quilters because these are women's stories and the, and, and they are domestic stories and I'm a very <laughs> I'm very domesticated you know <laughs> And, and, and they are they're stories about families and people's lives and but and doing the QSOS people have that space to tell these stories that in a magazine that space doesn't exist you know um just just because of the nature of the beast so I I love doing it and I love doing the deep dives into people's own quilting history whether you know uh it would it's interesting you talk to someone like Bonnie who did not although she feels like it's probably in her genes somewhere um but didn't come from a quilting family and then you talk to other people like I remember my granny and she had the frame on the ceiling and we brought in it's just like that's an amazing story too. It is history. And you know, I talk about the historic record, the historic document. This is this is a people's history as well as just good storytelling. So really for me, it's just, and it's about quilts. So what's not to love? Yeah. And it's that idea of a snapshot in time because Bonnie just was, I think she's serious, but she was talking about being, you know, going, working and doing what she's doing until she's 75. And I said, well, okay, well, let's go ahead and mark on the calendar. We're going to interview you again um, that year when you're yeah. 75, mm -hmm. because um, that's the interesting thing is what you say at any point in time in your quilting career in your life is going to capture all that's going on in that time and so a lot of times we can we can um the, the one of the reasons why we're trying to transfer the the collection to this new website with all these new tools and being able to search it is when you can search a collection like this in a really narrow way or a broad way you can find really interesting things like at one point i searched the word hurricane 
in the QSOS collection. And I found like a hundred hits or something like that, because if you think about it, people talking about their lives mm -hmm. and a lot of the interviews have been done in Texas or in the Gulf Coast where hurricanes happen and people talking about making quilts to give to someone uh, for a relief effort or um, it just, you know, as, as we all say, um, quilts are historical documents. They contain all these things. But, you know, I think, why do you think overall for our community, it's important to document these stories, especially documenting quilt stars like the mayor yeah. of Quiltville, Yes. But also people who maybe are just starting their career or someone who just sees themselves as a hobbyist and just uses that word. I'm just, I'm just, I just make quilts. Yeah. Which, yeah. I, and it's just like, get that just out of that sentence. You make quilts. Yeah. And we, we, we're all quilting at different levels and making different kinds of quilts. You know, for me, uh, you know, Bonnie talks about community and is a community builder. And it's one of the reasons that I love her. Um, and I think that so many of us feel connected to one another right here in this space, because most I'm assuming 99.9% .9 of us are here because we make quilts and um, are, are already in probably communities together. But I do think we have this community just through the act of making quilts, but it's not, I feel connected to the women who came before me. Yeah who made quilts. And I, I'm someone who started, again, I, I've been quilting for about 15 years, maybe a little longer. And so, and I love quilt history and I read those uh, quilt history books uh, and, and a lot, you know, there were all those do uh, documentation projects in the eighties and nineties. And I read them and I'm reading something, some woman in Nebraska, 1906, here's her quilt and her great grandchildren are telling her story. And I'm like, I feel connected to that woman. <laughs> And I also feel by recording our stories now that the quilters who come along after us will also feel that connection through time. And I think that, you, you know, I'm, I can get very woo. But I, can, <laughs> I, th I think that as human beings, we need to feel connected to the past and we f need to feel like we have stories that are worth, you know, uh, documenting for the people who come after us and and you know certainly our families but I think other quilters uh, I it, you know I Bonnie got emotional when she was talking about um the the people the friends and relationships that she has formed as a result of yeah. being a quilter. and so many of us feel this way um and and and, it, and again it goes it's it's on a spectrum it's I feel can when I again I see a quilt from 1864 I'm just like Oh, my people, you know, and, and I, I would love for, uh, you know, a hundred years from now, someone's going to watch this QSOS interview or read the transcript and go, Oh, my people, you know, and we need exactly. that. That, that. Oh, my people. These are my people. And again, but I, I, I also think that our stories, no matter what level we're quilting at, I just feel like that, that we are making stuff that we go, we take bits and pieces of fabric and we make things that we are that we use in our house or houses or get that's kind of weird and interesting <laughs> but we still do this. what are we doing y'all we got other things to do but we do it because we're creative and we love it and it's community and um and it's worth noting and I think 100 wow. people should know we were doing this we could have gone to Target but we didn't we stayed home with our sewing machines and we made quilts and you should yeah. know that so anyway. hallelujah Francis I'm sorry to cut you off with my sides because we do have to go I just went, went real quickly and said if you're if you really believe if you've been sitting there saying amen amen this is important please support us the giving quilt is on our website quiltalliance.org next week talk is going to be fabulous Sacred Threads, Expressing Life's Journeys. But both Francis and I have attended Sacred Threads. It's an incredible organization and exhibit. And next month, as I promised, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your voice. You can upload your, um, you can sign up to be on Textile Talks by giving, a, recording a video about your quilt, a special quilt, one you've made or one you have. And the information is in the chat box and you'll see it again. And I just want to thank everyone for being here today and all our sponsors. I'm going to stop my screen share so Lucy can um, 
give us a quick video about our sponsors again, but we are so delighted you uh, joined us, especially during this holiday weekend. Thanks Take care, everyone. everyone. Thank you, Francis. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, everyone. I'm so glad you were here. Take care.